Darkcast Network. Welcome to the dark side of podcasts. Content warning ahead. This podcast contains very sensitive topics such as missing persons, unsolved cases, haunted houses, and paranormal activity. These type of topics can contain very upsetting, sensitive details and stories. Please listen responsibly. Welcome to Misty Mysteries, a podcast in the business of ghostly spooks and chilling crimes. I'm your host, Keely, and I am excited to share today's topics with you. This place I'm going to be talking about today is now apartments and a cemetery. It's a place that's been on the top of my list after seeing it all over my TikTok, especially after one of my favorite TikTok creators, My Bloody Galentine, bought doors from this building, and when one of my favorite YouTube channels, Grim Life Collective, were able to not only show the cemetery, but get a tour of the apartments that stand today. It's the inspiration for Gotham Asylum, the home of Poison Ivy, Harley Quinn, Joker, and countless Batman enemies. Getting right into it, it's the Danvers State Hospital. I'm joined on this episode by Brenda, the host of Horrifying Histories and fellow Darkcast Network member. She's going to take it away to tell you all about the history of this hospital and how it got to where it is today. There is a building in Danvers, Massachusetts that is quite breathtaking. The facility that once housed the Danvers State Hospital is now home to a residential community, and it's filled with renovated apartments. But its gothic style and red brick construction hides a very dark history, and many think that this history cursed this building. In fact, many people believe that this building is one of the creepiest monuments to insane asylums in the world today. Originally called the State Lunatic Asylum, the Denver State Hospital was developed under a new ideology that started during the late 1800s, that people with psychological problems needed to get cured inside specially made facilities. As part of this, the facility was created to be self-sustaining, with everything it needed being produced on-site. Construction started in 1874, and the first patients were admitted four years later. The goal was to completely cure all of these patients of their illnesses. Danvers State Hospital was considered to be a success at first. By 1900, the hospital had 125 employees and had treated over 9,500 patients since it opened in 1878. It quickly developed a good reputation, and this is what led to this hospital's downfall. Over the next 20 years, the hospital was reported to have more than 2,000 inpatients, even though the building's capacity was only for 450. Those running the Danvers knew that they did not have the facilities or the staff to handle this patient load, and they begged the state for more money. The state didn't care and provided nothing. This is when the patient abuse started. Patients would have to live in their own filth and did not even have basic hygiene. They were lucky if they even had clothes. Shock therapy and straitjackets became the norm to make people complacent or to have them scared into full submission. Patients quickly learned that if staff thought that they were going to speak up in any way, they would either have to endure more shock therapy or would be put into a straitjacket and forgotten about. There was no more getting cured at this hospital as the patient's mental health only worsened under these conditions. So this is when Danvers brought in lobotomies. They thought this was a cure for any mental health issue, and they were being used as a way to slow the deaths that were occurring at this facility. By 1939, the population at the hospital was now sitting at 2,360 patients, with 278 of them dying in that year alone. So what better thing to do than to take away a patient's mind, and that is why many neurology experts believe that Danvers was the birthplace for the prefrontal lobotomy. By the early 1940s, lobotomy patients would just walk aimlessly throughout the halls, staring blankly at the walls. If they didn't have a lobotomy, they would just walk around in a drug-induced haze. Now, this worked really well for staff, since nobody was complaining anymore. For these patients, there was no end for their hell. No staff would allow them to leave, and they were held permanently against their will as the buildings fell into disrepair. The lack of funding continued, which made the conditions worse and worse until finally, the state started to close portions of the hospital in 1969. It was closed for good in 1992, and in 2005, it was bought by a development company. They tore down a large portion of the buildings on site and then turned what was left into the Avalon Danvers apartments. 
the only physical thing that remains of the horrors that happened on this site is the nearby cemeteries. There are two of them, which contain 770 deceased patients. Danvers continued to show a lack of dignity towards their former patients in death, since a good portion of these headstones do not even have names on them, only numbers. It is because of this, and all of the abuses that happened here, that it is said that this now picturesque place is quite haunted. In fact, many believe that all of the souls of the tortured former patients have permanently cursed this land. Oh my, Brenda, could those people be more right about the haunting of this land? You did such an amazing job telling us about the history of this hospital, with the neglect and the cruelty that happened on this land and in this building it has to leave at least a residual energy. This property and the buildings on it haven't been a stranger to hauntings starting all the way back to when it was still open and full functioning, or what you could call full functioning for this hospital at least. When it was operating, patients and medical staff saw apparitions of patients roaming the halls and standing staring at walls. One woman who grew up on the property at one of the houses there built for staff because her father was an administrator for the hospital, and since it was made to be isolating and self-sufficient, like many mental health facilities at the time, those working had to bring their families with them. Growing up here left her and her siblings with enough paranormal encounters to fill their lifelong ghostly meter, maybe even overfill it. Many of these spirits they encountered came off as mean and upset at them. Her most memorable spirit was when she and two of her siblings were playing in the attic of the home. All of a sudden, an old, angry woman appeared in front of them. She just stood there scowling and staring at the children while they froze in fear. The only thing that broke this frozen state was her mother calling the children for dinner, but when it was broken, they ran out of there as quickly as they could. Then, when she was in her teen years, she would wake up most nights to her sheets being yanked off of her. All throughout her life there, she and her family experienced phantom footsteps throughout the house and lights turning on and off on their own. Phantom footsteps were not only isolated to this home. It was a general experience throughout the buildings on the property, including the main bat-shaped structure itself. On rainy days, footsteps would be heard coming from the top floor, but no matter the weather conditions, on top of past patients being seen and standing around, Talking and crying is heard, including cries for help and attention. A deep sense of pain and sadness was felt throughout the land, but especially in the main bat-shaped hospital building. Learning about the history of this land, I wonder if some of this pain and sadness could be linked to the original owner of the land, John Hawthorne, the judge who presided over the Salem witch trials. Just imagining the kind of sadness and negativity that follows a person like that in life It's really no wonder a place like this is full of sad and awful energy. Hoping that most of this is residual, it makes me wonder what is felt today, given not much of the original architecture and building are left. Today, not all the buildings remain due to construction and fires. The only thing left is the Danvers State Cemetery, which remains the resting place for many of the hospital's patients, and most of the exterior walls of the main bat-shaped hospital building, which is now a common area, offices, and apartments. I personally like to believe that maybe the spirits who haven't moved on are swimming in the pool and playing with all that these luxury apartments have to offer, living the life they couldn't in the afterlife. But what to do current residents and the few who successfully trespass during the abandoned years, even with police patrol over the property, have to say about these spirits? Those who managed to break in and investigate when it was abandoned often caught EVPs or phantom footsteps, but not many videos have emerged from those years and investigations, at least with any evidence of the paranormal scene. Overall, it seems the owners of the years have tried to keep the tales of paranormal at bay, but the new owners have taken a special interest in the history of the land. Where the nurses' homes used to be, now sits plaques with detailed history of the hospital, photos and information on the staff, and pictures from inside the hospital when it was an asylum. A path has also been made to the cemetery to help visiting the patients a little easier. A proper stone sign has been placed 
with the name of the cemetery and another with a list of most who have been laid to rest there. Maybe all put into place to remember the hospital's history and the patients has helped find the spirit's closure in the afterlife because visitors now tend to report a calm and home-like feeling in the apartments. At this time, one of the most popular claims and one of the really only claims is that black shadows or gray mists move throughout the property. This brings an end to today's special on the Danvers State Hospital with my friend Brenda. She does an amazing job at telling the history, crimes, and hauntings of places on her podcast. I have another collab with Brenda from back at the beginning of this podcast if you want to hear more, or you can simply head over to her podcast to listen to what she has to offer. Please remember to share the podcast and leave a review if you enjoy Misty Mysteries. For now, I will see you next week for more ghostly spooks and chilling crimes.